Thank you so much, Maya. Thank you everyone for coming tonight. It's really great to be here and great to see a bunch of people and a lot of familiar names and, and some I don't know. It's, it's great to see everybody here from all over the place. Um, so we are, Bob and, and I, with David's help, are gonna talk tonight about old forests in plain sight is what we're calling it. And <clears throat> what this means is that we're gonna, we're gonna be looking at some places that have old forests, old growth forests, um, ancient forests, whatever we'll call them, in places that you might not expect. So with that, we'll just get, get right, right into it and start by defining what an old forest, what an old growth forest is. We have some different terms here. We have old growth forest and old forest and some others as well. But if you want to know what an old growth forest is, it is, um, and we've heard this term, an old growth forest is one that simply has been around for a very long time without, without um, significant human disturbance. So one of our colleagues, Charlie Cogbill, defines it as continuity of process over time. Simply process, ecological processes um, happening in, in um, over time, sometimes three to four centuries without, without human intervention, according to David Foster. Other terms we have are primary forest, original forest, virgin forest, forest primeval, ancient forest, and ancient woodland are some of the terms that you'll hear. An old forest, on the other hand, in contrast to an old growth forest, it might be an old growth forest too, but it's a broader term, meaning a forest that is on its way to being old growth. It might not be as old. It might not have been free of human disturbance for three or four centuries. It might be only a century or a century and a half. But if, and if there are old trees, they'll be usually more than 150 years old. And it shows some characteristics of old growth forests. And what you might see in some old forests include trees of many different ages, some very large old trees, canopy gaps, um, which are openings in the canopy, down wood in all stages of decay, mycorrhizal networks, which are the fungal networks in the soil that help to feed the trees, lots of standing dead wood, uh, tip up mounds and seeming disarray. It's the old growth forests and old forests look messy. And um, that's a good thing. Now our classic view of the old growth forest or the old forest is one of sort of a cathedral-like experience. You walk into the woods and there's huge giant old trees and you, you look up in the sky and they're towering up um, taller than most other forests. This is our concept or conception of, of old forest. But what we're gonna look at today, and here's some examples of, of kind of classic old forests. There is our colleague David with his dog Acer in an old forest that the Vermont Land Trust has a conservation easement on in Barnard. And there's Bob Zeno, who is in an old growth forest on state land in Granville, admiring a beautiful old ash tree. And there is my son hugging a uh, large cottonwood tree. We don't know how old that is, maybe not very old, but it's a big tree. Um, so in this presentation, we are going to look at and see um, some very large and uh, very majestic trees like this black gum tree with its deeply fissured bark. We're also going to be looking at some trees that don't look old at all and that you would never know are old. For example, some of the trees on the top of Mount Mansfield in this photograph by Eric Sorensen. So we're going to be looking at a number of different kinds of forest types, a number of different kinds of natural communities in which uh, trees are old but may not look old. And so we'll talk a little bit about how we know they're old, how we age trees, and how we figure all of this out. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Bob. Thanks. So I wanted to start with a story about some of Vermont's uh, most recently discovered old forest. And uh, this story is really one uh, of my colleague and friend, Matt Peters, who did this work this past summer. And Matt got interested in these red cedar woodland forests 
and decided to uh, investigate whether some of these in Vermont were old forests. Uh, Matt is a consulting ecologist, which as far as I can tell means that he does what he wants when he wants and gets to do cool projects like this. And there we go. Uh, whoops, yeah, it's too many slides. So red cedar woodlands, many people know red cedar as an early successional tree uh, that grows in old fields after they've been abandoned, uh, something you might see in a power line right of way, and particularly in southern New England, less so as you go further north and into the colder regions of northern New England. But in Vermont, we have red cedar woodlands on these west or south facing bluffs, particularly in the Champlain Valley, where the cedar trees are exposed, uh, like you can see in this great illustration by Libby, David, Libby Davidson that was in Wetland Woodland Wildland. Liz, I'm getting a little delay on the slide advancing and I'm wondering if you might be able to help me out with that. Thanks. So in New Hampshire, they, they also have these red cedar woodlands. Uh, and this is a rare natural community in both states. Uh, New Hampshire ecologists did a study a few years ago and found that many of their red cedar woodlands uh, had surprisingly old trees. Uh, as you can see here, so many were uh, 250 years old or older. And then they found this one tree, the one on the right here that I guess they called the narwhal, that was 575 years old. So Matt was reading this report and thinking, well, we've got, uh, we've got trees like that here in Vermont. And uh, let's go look at them and see what, what there is. Uh, Liz, can you go to the next slide? So these red cedar woodlands, like I said, they're on these exposed, exposed bluffs, and they're places that are stressful conditions for trees to grow. They're hot, uh, droughty sites with very shallow soils or almost no soil, like you can see this tree just growing out of the rock. And they're places where the ruggedness keeps people away. So these, while people do get to these spots and might have cut a few trees for a fence post or maybe to have a campfire at a spot with a nice view, for the most part, these are not places that are attracting people to uh, cut down all the trees. And those are all factors that lead to or promote uh, long-lived trees. So here's some of the places where those red cedar woodlands are. This is Austin Hill in the town of West Haven. And then this next one is Snake Mountain. Uh, there are red cedar woodlands in the part of Snake Mountain that many people know from the hiking trail, but also uh, along the whole ridge of Snake Mountain, there's, there's many, many red cedar woodlands on that uh, west facing bluff. And here you can see the view out uh, towards the, across the Champlain Valley towards the Adirondacks. So Matt used a technique uh, called increment coring or increment boring to uh, look at the tree rings in a tree. And he used this tool uh, this is a common way that ecologists and foresters study tree growth. It bores a small uh, profile of the tree that can be extracted. This has uh, really no impact on the tree. The, it's only the very outer portion of the tree that's alive. And doing this is really no more harmful than, uh, say, putting in a sugar maple tap. Uh, the tree, if it's healthy, can quickly heal it over. So it's a, a fairly, while it seems like it might be a, a potentially destructive way to sample a tree, it's actually uh, fairly benign. And it pulls out a, a full sample of the tree rings. And here you can see on a, a cut red cedar what those rings look like. And you can get a sense of how close together they are. But extracting a, a straw-sized core of those uh, that you can see here. And then using, in the field, you can use a hand lens to uh, look at these rings. And you can also take them back to a lab and sand them down and uh, do some treatments to them to really make the rings stand out. So I joined Matt in the field when I, when I took these pictures and this was at Niquette Bay State Park. And I, I made the mistake of joining him at what ended up being the youngest of all the red cedar woodlands that he visited. This site, the average tree, uh, like this one here was only 90 years old. Although 
for a tree that's not very big, 90 years old, uh, might be kind of surprising. And the oldest trees were maybe 135 years old. But Matt went to other sites and he found five sites with trees greater than 150 years old. And four of them were uh, sites that had trees greater than 200 years old. And two of them had trees greater than 300 years old. And these trees are trees like this, this twisted, gnarly uh, red cedar hanging off the side of this cliff or, or clinging to the side of this cliff. And uh, uh, this is just the result of being in those harsh conditions. So this tree was 287 years old, this wavy, uh, crazy tree. That's a tree that started growing in 1734. This next tree is 318 years old. This is at the Fairly, Paris, Fairly Palisades that you can see driving on I-91. You can look up uh, from the highway, you can actually see the highway in this photo and, and you could try to find this tree, 318 years old. That's 1704 when that tree got established. Matt's work has got me thinking about all the other places where uh, there are red cedars, uh, like this one that I found a few years ago and, and has me wondering what the ages of these trees are. And uh, I'm really excited to go back to some other sites and, and look at the ages of the trees. This is at uh, Pond Woods Wildlife Management Area in Orwell and Benson. One thing, these trees are, they're often described like I did as stunted or gnarly, twisted. And uh, the language tends to imply that there's this inferiority to these trees growing on these sites. But really they're, they're surviving in these harsh conditions and doing what trees need to do, uh, producing energy, reproducing uh, and persisting, persisting longer than uh, their relatives that are uh, down on better growing sites even. So, in some ways, thinking of these trees as inferior may be just the totally wrong way of looking at it. These trees are, are doing just what they need to do in these sites. And just a fun fact about eastern red cedar, uh, these uh, blue berries are not actually berries at all. They're actually cones, just like a pine cone or a spruce cone. Uh, they're the, this is a conifer tree with cones, and that's how they've uh, developed into these berry-like structures. Juniper berries from a related uh, shrub, common juniper, the ones that are used to flavor gin. And up in these red cedar woodlands, uh, it's possible to stumble upon a number of rare and uncommon plants like this rock spike moss, uh, a vascular plant, but one very, very closely related to non-vascular plants like mosses. This is this is a flowering, uh, excuse me, this is a vascular plant, but not flowering. So let's go to an even more exposed site. And I, I really like this painting uh, that shows just how long Mount Mansfield has attracted visitors up to the Alpine zone. Liz hinted that we were gonna get to uh, travel up here. This uh, painting is a lot like the one that is in wetland, woodland, wildland. Uh, by Libby Davidson. A little less dramatic, but I think still capturing the, the essence of this uh, exposed alpine zone up at 4,000 feet. This is a place where trees are, again, stunted and twisted, uh, growing without much soil or in very wet soil that's uh, over bedrock. The species up here are uh, black spruce and balsam fir, or black spruce, red spruce hybrids. Red spruce is our common spruce tree that we see uh, throughout uh, natural places in Vermont. Black spruce is less common. Uh, it's a boreal tree that's uh, the real center of its range is up in the boreal forest in Canada. And Thinking about the conditions up in the alpine zone, we have to think about winter and, and what these trees experience with snow and ice and wind in that season. And uh, one of the terms I've heard for these trees when they get buried by snow is snow ghosts. And I think that's a very apt name. So to talk about this, I actually wanna go to a place far away, go to Sweden, uh, 
to a mountain in Sweden where there's what may be, or what is reported to be the oldest known tree in the world. And this is, uh, I'm gonna probably mangle this pronunciation, but I will try the best I can. Old Chico, uh, this is a 16 foot tall tree. It's both the, the regular tree-like piece that you see there and also that mat of evergreen branches down at the ground that's connected to it. Yeah, thanks for pointing that out. Um, this tree is thought to be 9,500 years old. 9,500 years old. It seems unbelievable. And the, the catch here is that this tree, this living stem that we're looking at is not actually 9,000 years old. But this tree, this, uh, this genetic individual has persisted for 9,000 years by a process called layering, where its branches touch the ground, new roots establish, and a new tree can develop from that spot. So these lower spreading branches can reroot and become new trees. And I tried my hand at some uh, artwork here to try to uh, indicate that. And uh, I don't know how well I can point this out, but. This is supposed to be a tree and these are the roots. And this is a lower branch that comes down and it establishes new roots and a new stem. And then over time, that connection breaks and it becomes two different trees. The other thing that can happen, even if, even if it doesn't do this process called layering, is just that the top of the tree can get snapped off and one of these other branches can take over and become the lead of the tree. So the actual number of rings on a tree might not really indicate the age of the, the tree or how long that genetic individual has been alive. And I guess we can quibble over whether this is the same tree or a different tree, but uh, from the passing on the genes perspective, it's, it's made it 9,000 years. The other thing that's... Uh, Oh, sorry, the other thing I was gonna say is that this is a process that happens not just in alpine zones, but in bogs and other settings too. So here we can see black spruce, not the, um, the yellow is the uh, tamarack, but the black spruce is the green tree there. And it's very similar. Uh, it can do this process of layering and establishing new trees. This is peach and bog here in Vermont. And, oh, there's a question in the chat. How do they know it's 9,000 years old? Uh, so I believe they've done radiocarbon dating on the wood beneath the tree. And I, I think there may have been some genetic work done too. Uh, I have to admit, I'm not fully up on it, but this is, is generally kind of recognized as, as the oldest tree. It's named after the discoverer's uh, dog, by the way. So looking at that tree with that mat of branches on the ground and then the tall uh, the tall stem with a little clump of, of uh, green at the top uh, just got me to this uh, image from a paper about uh, black spruce growth, growth forms at tree line and it, how the snow level, uh, which is protective in winter, it actually, uh, it's relatively warm. It is not wind blasted. Uh, so under that snow level in winter, tree branches can do really well. The ones that get above it are the ones blasted by wind and immediately above the snow is actually some of the harshest because that's where those snow and ice crystals are really moving. And then if it can get a little taller, it starts to be in a, in a position where it can put out some more foliage. So depending on the exposure, there's uh, uh, different, different growth forms that you might see. And this is this study that this, picture, this uh, illustration from is actually one of continental tree line, not alpine, but looking at uh, our alpine zone, we can actually see similar growth patterns. And hopefully the slide will advance. There we go. You can see the, the low mat of green where all the branches are down low and then the ones that stick up tend to be wind blasted and uh, following some of that pattern. So you're probably wondering, I've, I've talked a lot about the alpine zone and I haven't said anything about actual tree ages here in Vermont. And uh, well, we don't know. 
but in New Hampshire, balsam fir in Krumholtz is found to be 150 years old, and black spruce has been found to be 200 years old. In some ways, the, the tree ages may not be as important because there's this, like Liz said at the beginning, this continuity of process. This natural community has persisted over time. It hasn't been cleared or, or harvested for sure. And the natural processes are just continuing and the trees are doing what they do appropriate for that natural community. And I think many people would consider that an old forest or old growth ecosystem, uh, regardless of whether the trees are uh, 100 years or 150, or if the trees live to longer than that. Just a quick tour of some neat things that you can see in the alpine zone, a very rare plant in Vermont because it's uh, only found in two places, I think, on Mount Mansfield is dwarf birch, relative of our more common birches, but grows as a shrub and it's, it's common further north, but uh, we have just a few of them here. And then the, the many uh, awesome plants that grow in the alpine zone, uh, like Labrador tea, mountain cranberry, bilberry, diapensia, and not a plant, but uh, Bicknell's thrush, which lives only in the high elevation Krumholtz and spruce fir forests. And this is such a great picture that I just wanted to use it again to conclude this section on the Alpine Zone. The third natural community that I'd like to talk about is uh, our red maple black gum basin swamps. And I want to start with a, a little paper that was published by Hub Vogelman, who worked in the University of Vermont Botany Department and was sort of the uh, inspiration for the field naturalist program that I've participated in. And Liz has taught uh, students that for many years and many other uh, friends and colleagues have gone through. Uh, he reported finding this unusual black gum swamp in Maine. And black gum is a Southern tree that uh, just barely makes it up into Northern New England. And, uh, reported that there was this four inch section of, the tr of a trunk with 177 rings. So black gum is a really distinctive tree. Uh, as Liz showed, it's got this deeply, deeply furrowed and blocky bark. And just to get a sense of the scale there, just look at how deep and craggy that bark is. It's really, really wild. And the Branching pattern is very distinctive. It has these uh, right angles that form. It has these flowers that are totally not showy. Uh, and for a long time, people thought that the tree was uh, likely wind pollinated, but there was some work, uh, an observer found that uh, just watching the trees in the spring, uh, that many, many species of native bees were going to black gum trees. I think something like 37 different species of bee were visiting the tree over a relatively short time. These black gum swamps have uh, deep peat soils, uh, large accumulations of organic matter, uh, very acidic sites, wet and acidic sites. So this, this swamp in, uh, in Maine, uh, this is a photo of that one that Hub Vogelman reported. There's also black gum swamps in New Hampshire that have uh, been studied uh, relatively recently and have been found to have trees 700 years old. Uh, 700 years old is a tree that established in 1321. Uh, well, give or take. Uh, I, think they, I think I'm rounding the tree age, but 1321 was when they thought it established. And, uh, I was trying to put that in context, and the only thing that I could find that uh, for context was that that's just a few years after the events of the movie Braveheart, or whatever that's worth. Braveheart was uh, probably not the most historically accurate movie, but I think there were some based on some real events. Anyway, this is the swamp in uh, Vernon, Vermont, a black gum swamp that's well known. Uh, 
an easy place to visit, as I'll show in a moment. Uh, you can see that craggy black gum tree on the left. Uh, there was work done in the swamp in 1988 on these big trees, and one of them was found to be 435 years old uh, at that time. And I don't know if that tree is still alive or which tree it was. I wish I did. Uh, I hope that someone knows that and I can track that down at some point. Uh, but I think it indicates the, the age, the general potential for these trees, particularly knowing the ages of those trees in New Hampshire and Maine. Uh, hopefully it's not on this next photo, this tree that fell down and was totally hollow on the inside. I learned something interesting about black gum a few years ago uh, when I found this. I discovered that black gum seems to be like candy for beavers. And this black gum swamp, this is another one in Vernon, not the uh, well-known swamp, but uh, one nearby. Beavers had found their way up to it, and they had selectively, it appeared, chewed on just about every black gum and uh, either girdled or dropped all of the trees, and including some, some rather large ones, and uh, had, let's see if I can advance the slide here, had even gone so far as to, there's one of the big trees that they had girdled. And one of the swamps had been totally flooded. So this was unfortunate for this particular swamp, but it also kind of pointed out if there's trees that are hundreds of years old and have not been found by beaver, uh, just shows that they're isolated swamps that are, uh, have existed that long without that disturbance. And the fact that now beaver were getting up into them likely implied something about the beavers being displaced from their usual habitat and being pushed into more marginal habitat which is an interesting thing to think about, I guess, uh, for a species that's relatively common. Uh, and then to just end with a few plants uh, in the black gum swamp, this is Virginia chain fern, uh, state endangered plant. Has these really cool uh, sori. There's winterberry holly, and there's also a rare uh, species of uh, re closely related to this that grows in those swamps as well. And then there's mountain laurel, uh, which is a species uh, common in the mid-Atlantic and uh, southern New England and just barely makes it up into Vermont in the uh, southeastern and southwestern region. So at the, at the end of the talk, we're going to uh, suggest some places to visit some of these, but I just wanted to share that the, the black gum swamp in Vernon is part of the town forest. And uh, they, not only is it accessible, it's, it's uh, the town welcomes visitors and encourages visitors to see this black gum swamp. So you can find this brochure online. So with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Liz. Okay, I cannot, um, can you hear me, Bob? Yep, we can hear you and see the photo. Okay, great. All right, so I'm gonna talk about, <clears throat> about a couple of different natural communities. Um, one of them, so the Black Gum Swamp reminds me of uh, another place, another kind of swamp, another kind of wetland where you can find uh, northern white, where you can find very large trees, and in this case, northern white cedar trees. So this is northern white cedar, a Thuya occidentalis, a beautiful, it's also known as the tree of life. This is the range of northern white cedar. It's a smallish range for a tree, and um, the, the tree occurs in, in a broad swath across southern Canada and northern New England. But really here in the southern part of, of New England, it's really quite rare. Um, and then there's a little spot of it in Northwestern Connecticut. And, but there's little spots of it down the Appalachians uh, in, in just very, very small areas. So it's, we're really in a way at the Southern edge of its range. Now this Northern White Cedar Swamp in Greensboro, Vermont, in Northern Vermont is one where there's a mix of trees, some very large um, 
some smaller, but there's some huge trees in this forest. Uh, this is owned by, by um, a group called the um, Green Mountain Monastery, and this is one of the sisters of the monastery. And this is another northern white cedar swamp nearby in Greensboro, Vermont, again with some lar very large trees and a few smaller trees that can be really uh, a mix of sizes. And again, just by looking at the size of the tree, um, there's a person there to for scale. We don't know uh, how old these trees really are until we age them, until we core them. But there's some very large uh, trees in these cedar swamps, mossy bases, beautiful, beautiful swamps these are. Now here's a core from one of these cedar trees in, a, in northern Vermont. And you can see in this core, there's a very, uh, each one of these rings that you can see. So I'm pointing to one growth ring that represents one year of growth. And this is my thumb for, for a scale. But you can see there was a period of time when the growth rings are really, really tiny, 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 um, you know, a fraction of a millimeter. And uh, so, so the rate of growth in northern white cedar is really quite variable. And um, he, I'm going to talk a little bit about how, how northern white cedar reproduces. Um, we talked, so this is a cone of northern white cedar, again, sort of like the red cedar. It's an unusual um, little tiny cone. Um, and it does produce seeds, and the seeds love a seed bed like this, uh, and a down mossy log. This is D David McMath in the Cedar Swamp at Mud Pond in um, Greensboro, a property that we own, the Vermont Land Trust owns, and we have protected as a natural area. And uh, so it's a great seed bed for northern white cedar to get established. And there's a little seedling. But the really fascinating thing about northern white cedar is that uh, just like the black spruce in the balsam fir that Bob was talking about a couple of minutes ago, it can actually uh, reproduce by layering, by uh, forming new roots on stems underground when it gets covered with moss. This is a group of people a couple of years ago kind of excavating the, the base of some young cedar trees to see where they came from. And they found that these little tiny cedar trees on the forest floor actually were attached to larger trees. So they had come from larger trees. And this is what they found. They found these, <clears throat> these under, under moss stems that had begun to form roots and formed new trees. So this is a set of one, two, three, four uh, new stems coming from one old tree in a, a northern white cedar swamp. Really fascinating. Northern white cedar swamps are also great places for wildlife. This is one that's been a bark that has been torn by a bear for kind of unknown reasons. And there's the bear track. They're also great habitat for um, lots of different plants. Um, this funny little horse tail, this curly little horse tail at the base of a tree. Fascinating through a plant just like climbing right up the tree. Mossy places with squaros moss, uh, knight's plume moss, and some of the interesting uh, vascular plants that grow in these swamps, water avens, and the very rare marsh valerian, which we, we discovered uh, in the swamp in Newark, Vermont, a couple of years ago, maybe the third population known in Vermont. Um, and also the extremely rare fairy slipper, which has not been seen in Vermont in at least 20 years. Another natural community that is featured um, uh, in this that I'm going to talk about for a second I, I, is, um, so just picture yourself um, enjoying a beach on Lake Champlain and enjoying uh, just, just even maybe by boat or maybe just hanging around on a beach. And you've probably seen this kind of, this kind of view here. And um, you might be looking over there and saying, oh, that's nice, you know, a, a cliff, bluff, um, good place to jump off and <laughs> go diving. Or you might have seen this, as I did, from the ferry boat that, that goes over to, um, to Plattsburgh from, from Grand Isle. And there's a northern white cedar growing on the bluff of this cliff. And look at how they have cut a view in the northern white cedar on that bluff. 
And here's another, if you were on Lone Rock Point, you might see this, um, it, looking across Eagle Bay, you might see this view of some cedars kind of clinging to the cliff. And if you're walking on Rock Point, you might see this, you might be, uh, be right behind this fence, which is meant to protect people from falling off the cliff into the lake. And look at those trees. They're not particularly huge trees, um, but they're fascinating. And look at this one. This reminds me, doesn't it remind you of the, um, of the um, red cedar, the Eastern red cedar that Bob was talking about just a minute ago. So in these places, in these limestone bluff cedar pine forests, as we call them, um, we see these gnarled old trees, um, often with mosses at the base and uh, really just fascinating places. And look at this, the trees are just clinging to the cliffs for dear life in many cases. And we don't know how old this tree is, but it's been hanging there for a long time. And sometimes the trees are very large as, um, as this tree is being being embraced by my little my young friend Beatrix uh, Grenier, um, and sometimes they're not so big, like this smallish tree that's being cored by Bob Zeno, and there he is uh, coring the tree, and here is a core from that tree, which um, thankfully his fingers are there to give scale. And again, look at those individual tree rings. They're really, really tiny. This tree was growing very, very slowly. In the same general area, but further away from the cliff, there were other cedar trees in a younger forest. And, um, and these trees have much larger growth rings. They're growing in deeper soil and just have a really different growth rate. So the, the growth rates of northern white cedar can really um, can vary quite a lot. And um, on the cliffs, they grow really, really slowly. And here's another case where we can see this happened to be a wedged tree. We didn't do this, but found this tree um, with, a, with a wedge cut out of it um, in that same area where Bob was coring the tree. And look at this, if you look at this, um, wedge closely, you can see that the growth rates, this is one year's growth here. And um, there's a difference between the sort of the saw marks and the actual growth rings, but this is a growth ring. This tree was growing very, very fast during that time. But then look at these rings in this, in this kind of scarred area of the tree, the tree and over here, the tree is growing very, very slowly. Now, this is a really fascinating phenomenon. Um, these cliff dwelling trees are something that has been documented from the what's called the Niagara Escarpment, a geological feature that, that runs from Lake Ontario over to the west side of Lake, Lake Michigan on the Great Lakes. Um, it's a fascinating limestone formation and characterized by cliffs. And on these cliffs are these ancient old cedars um, documented in this really wonderful book called The Last Stand, a journey through the ancient cliff-based forest of the Niagara Escarpment. And you can see in this picture from the, the, the cover of the book, um, you can see these gnarled old trees, uh, just like the ones that we've been talking about, the red cedar. Um, and some of the trees in this forest are more than a thousand years old. Uh, fascinating, fascinating forest. And this is a great book that tells the story of this. This is one of the researchers, a fuzzy photo, but this is one of the authors of that book, um, hanging off the cliff and doing the research on the tree. You can see that he's holding an increment borer and <laughs> trying to hang on for dear life while he's coring that tree to estimate its age. Um, one of the oldest trees, the oldest tree in this forest was found to be over 1,600 years old, that is 1,600 years old, extremely old tree. So the soils in these forests are, this is a dolomite bedrock exposure. So the, in, in dolomite is a rock that is related to limestone. It's high in calcium and creates very fertile soils. And although there's, you would think there's no soil there, there's actually a little bit of soil that forms between the rocks just enough for the finer roots of the tree to get some nutrition and uh, for, for the um, 
for the tree to be a, get established. And then it can just hold on to dear life in this, in this situation. And um, interestingly, however, uh, the, this natural community doesn't always occur on limestone. This is a, an example of that natural community that occurs on granite bedrock in the Northeast Kingdom. Fascinating, fascinating um, situation there. But most of the time, this is a P soil pH kit, and most of the time the soils in these uh, natural communities are, if you want to match the colors up, somewhere between 6.5 and 7 which is a neutral soil, which is a high pH soil for Vermont. Some of the interesting plants that we can find here, fun, not, not all of them rare, wild columbine clinging to the cliffs, um, walking fern, walrue, another interesting fern, my favorite sedge, ebony sedge, Seneca snake root, a rare plant that grows in these natural communities. Graham's rock press. And the very rare Ramshead lady slipper, um, which grows in, the, in this natural community. So there's some of the interesting and fascinating things that occur in northern, in the limestone bluff cedar pine forest. And now we're just gonna end with a few fun places to visit where you can go and see some of these um, these natural communities um, in, I mentioned Mud Pond in Greensboro, uh, which is owned by the Vermont Land Trust, where you can go see a really beautiful Northern White Cedar Swamp that is being protected as a natural area. Um, if you wanna go see subalpine Crumholt, so obviously you can go to Mount Mansfield, also Camel's Hump, but uh, Mount Mansfield is a great place to go and see that. If you wanna see a dwarf shrub bog, Peach and Bog in Groton State Forest is a great place to go, easy to get to and find. Um, if you want to see a limestone bluff cedar pine forest, go to Kingsland Bay State Park in Ferrisburg. Really great place to, um, oh, there I am. Uh, really great place to um, see that natural community. If you want to see a red cedar woodland, go to Snake Mountain Wildlife Management Area in Addison. Finally, a black gum swamp. Maynard Miller Town Forest in the town of Vernon. So those are just a few places to go and see um, unusual old forests. In the resources um, that we send you after the talk, we're going to actually include a list of, or a link to our website where there's a list of a few other old growth forests that are more of your um, classic large tree old growth forests, so that, that you'll get that resource um, after the webinar. Bob, I wonder if you'd like to talk a little bit about conservation. Sure. So I think that uh, hopefully we've, uh, with what we've shared tonight, we've showed just how each of these natural communities has its own, uh, how each of them is unique and with its own uh, mix of species and settings and ecological processes. And collectively, we've identified 97 different natural community types in Vermont. Not all of them uh, have trees that attain these great ages, but uh, 97 different natural community types, each with their own species, uh, each just as unique and special as these that we've shared tonight. And collectively, they're really the, the places that our native species uh, can thrive and that we can use as ways to identify and protect places to uh, protect the something like 20 to 40,000 species that are here in Vermont. These old forest natural communities, uh, when they're in this really uh, exceptional ecological condition uh, are just one of the, just like uh, that much more powerful for protecting all these species. And Liz and I have done work with many other uh, great scientists, including Eric Sorensen and uh, uh, many others, uh, trying to put those natural communities into a larger context. And how can we conserve uh, all the different species in Vermont, all the different natural communities, and uh, a network of forests and waters that are all uh, interconnected and allow species to move and thrive and change over time. And that work is Vermont conservation design. And uh, 
this is something that we're very excited about. You can see the map there on the right. But this is really a vision for conservation in Vermont, a scientific vision for conservation. And part of it is uh, having these very special places, these old forests, uh, as a critical conservation target. We need these old forests for many reasons. But they also can exist, and uh, we can uh, cherish them and protect them in a landscape where we have uh, working forests and uh, multiple uses of the forest and that uh, there's nothing incompatible about those goals. And so we really wanted to share that this vision is, is holistic and uh, broad. And I think uh, achievable too. And it's part of, a, uh, of scientific thinking that's much broader than just Vermont. Uh, including this work, Wildlands and Woodlands, uh, by David Foster and the Harvard Forests that identifies a goal almost identical to what we have in Vermont conservation design of having uh, roughly around 10% of uh, New England as old forest, letting 10% of New England uh, grow back to old forest. Right now we have probably less than 1% in uh, Vermont and the larger region. Uh, so this goal of of restoring old forests, both these unique natural communities like these bluffs and swamps, but also just the typical forests too. And then having them uh, in this larger forest context where there might be many uses of the forest uh, so that people in nature are both thriving. And I think with that, Liz, you have uh, something to close yeah, us out here. Close with a, with a, um, just a thought about being in old forests of any kind, uh, quote from Wendell Berry, I come into the peace of wild things who do not tax their lives with forethought of grief. For a time I rest in the grace of the world and am free. We would like to pause now and Maya, would you like to talk about um, upcoming events? Sure, so we have some really great um, upcoming events um, that I think will be of interest to folks joining us this evening. Um, on April 12th, in a couple of weeks, we have a webinar about vernal pools um, led by Alaire Diamond from VLT. And that will be followed up by some in-person visits um, that aren't listed here because we're still finalizing the details, but a few opportunities to join us at some different vernal pools in different parts of the state. Um, and you can register for the webinar part um, online now. On April 27th, Liz will be um, hosting a webinar about spring wildflowers um, and registration for that event will be on our website shortly. Um, and then looking ahead to the summer, we have a few events about old forests. Um, there'll be a webinar on June 15th about managing your uh, forest for old forest characteristics. Um, and then two in-person visits, one in June um, to a northern white cedar swamp, and then one at the end of August um, to a red cedar woodland. And um, more information about all of those events will be available on our website, um, vlt.org. Um, and you can also sign up for our email list um, to stay up to date about other future events. Um, well, you'll also be receiving an email um, tomorrow with a short survey that we, we'd love to hear your feedback about this event, as well as the resources um, that Liz mentioned earlier. Um, so with that, I think we can go ahead and take some questions. Um, so we have a question um, from Richard and Richard's wondering what kind of leaf and needle growth is evident on ancient red cedar trees? So that's a good question. And as far as I know, uh, it's no different than any other red cedar tree, but uh, that's as far as I know. One thing we do know is that very young red cedar have a very different kind of growth than the, than the mature ones. They have very spiky, very spiky growth as, and, and then the, a mature cedar, but not an old one, but a mature cedar will have more of the scaly needles. Great, thank you. Um, we have another question here about Dr. Vogelman's work. Um, and this person asks, Dr. Vogelman studied the impact of acid rain decades ago, especially on camel's hump. And they're wondering how has this impact um, changed over time potentially? Well, I'll, I'll take a stab at this and encourage others to jump in, uh, David and Liz. But acid rain, uh, 
is particularly damaging to spruce trees. And my understanding is that it's, uh, uh, makes them less cold tolerant and subject to freezing damage, uh, which can result in dieback. And so this was a big problem, uh, which I believe has improved to some extent. Uh, and so the, the high elevation red spruce and uh, I think black spruce as well were affected by that. The scale of that was, was uh, dramatic. I mean, the work that uh, Ab Vogelman was doing was uh, looking at the uh, dramatic effects of that, but it, it was not, uh, as I understand it, stand replacing, uh, wiping out all of the trees and sort of resetting everything. Uh, so uh, definitely a, an impact and a big impact, but not necessarily a full interruption of that continuity of process in those zones. Great, thanks, Bob. Um, our next question is from Patrick and Patrick asks, do you have any thoughts on climate change impact for some of these species and environments discussed in this presentation, such as um, swamps or alpine zones? I'll start with the swamps. Um, I think that some of these wetlands are really going to be quite resilient. Um, the microclimate in these wetlands is affected by groundwater, which, uh, which has a, a slower response time to climate change, to, to immediate climate effects and, and long range climate change. Um, so those places, I think, will be more, my, my guess, we don't know, but is will be more resilient to climate effects than some of the others. Um, Bob, since you talked about high elevation, perhaps you could address that. Yeah, high elevation communities seem like they'd be a simple one that uh, as the climate warms, uh, the tree line, the alpine zone would just creep higher up the mountain. And there's, but there's actually conflicting research about that. And there's some evidence that the frequent fog in the mountains helps to buffer climate change. Uh, there's also some uh, work that shows that the, the factors that maintain tree line are actually things like uh, ice damage from ice storms uh, and other severe events that aren't tied uh, directly to uh, climate or temperature rather. Uh, so the tree line may persist where it is longer even if the average temperature is warming. Of course, at a certain point, if if we start losing snow and ice, even on top of the mountains, then that would change. Uh, we know from what's happened over thousands of years that uh, there can be those changes from a tundra type community to a forest. So that's, that's certainly something that could happen. And then um, Liz, if, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll just mention about bluff communities and jump in. But I, I think those bluffs and west facing cliffs uh, south and west facing cliffs that are sun exposed and shallow soil and already drought prone, I think those are at high risk from climate change because uh, there's the potential for them to become even, uh, to just be even drier over time and to, uh, it'll be that much harder for uh, plants to persist in those settings. And we may see a, a gradual dieback of vegetation and more open rock in some of those communities over time. Uh, I, as the predictions are that we'll, will be both wetter and drier, but the will be wetter at times, but then have longer periods of dry conditions. So that would uh, make those sites that much harsher. Great, thank you. Um, we have a couple questions about invasives. Um, folks wondering if any of the um, old growth forests shown tonight are particularly susceptible to invasive plants or animal species. Um, and if this has happened, You've seen this in any of the um, forests that you specifically mentioned this evening. David, would you take that one? Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, typically I think of buckthorn um, invading sort of, you know, disturbed lands, old ag, ag lands, edge communities, um, those kind of things. Um, 
you know, in a well stocked forest. Of course, I'm mostly up up north here, so it's I'm not seeing as bad as say like Peter Van Loon down in southern Vermont. Um, but the better stocked forest, I don't see as much. But it's we find it pretty much everywhere. If it's not buckthorn, it's um, you know some of the other ones, barberry or something like that. <clears throat> so. Um, yeah, it's it's here and it's a, it's a real threat. I, you know, I see that as a real threat to the <clears throat> the diversity of our forests and also with climate change throwing in some of that. You know, we're going to have these <clears throat> longer drought periods. We're going to have more moisture. Um, it creates more disturbance. You have more blowdown. That's going to make opportunities for these invasive species to come in. And so it's. I think for me personally, the, the invasive species are more scary with climate change than anything else. This slide that is up here is a, a photo from a black gum swamp. That's a black gum leaf sitting on a hemlock branch. And hemlock itself is very, very vulnerable to the hemlock woolly adelgid, right, David? So that yeah. component of some of these forests that's really, really a threat. Great, thank you. Um, and it is just about eight o'clock. Um, so we'll call this the official end of our webinar. Um, and thanks again, everyone for joining us this evening. Um, but our panelists um, have agreed to stay on um, for a little bit longer. So if you'd like to, to stay with us and um, hear answers to a few more questions, you're welcome to, but um, you're also welcome to drop off at this time. And thank you again um, for joining us this evening. Um, so we have a question here. Um, let's see, um, from somebody who would like to um, reforest part of their land that's been cleared and are, they're wondering if there are any resources for advice on how to do this, um, so that the new forest is native plants and replicates old forests interconnections of species as much as possible. David. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's a that's a really great question. I guess you know my fallback on a lot of this is um, give your county forester a call and start with that. That's a free call. Um, they're a wealth of information, and they can come out and they can steer you, uh, you know, to the right people because it's it's often difficult to find native plants and tree species and all that in any quantity to replant. So you do have to, you know, it, it takes a while to do that, um, but it's certainly doable. Um, you know, it really becomes a, a money thing a lot of times. Um, it just takes time and energy to, to, to plant those kind of things. So, um, but yeah, um, I would try the county forester and then go from there. You certainly to reach out to, to any of us. County forester, great. Great, great thanks. Thanks, David. Um, we have another question here. Um, can you speak to what ecological functions are enhanced with age and why these um, places might be special from a function perspective? Uh, would you like to start? Yeah. Sure. So in, maybe I'll start with the, the typical old forest, not one of these cliffside communities, but in a, a forest like the ones that we see most often, the northern hardwood forest or a hemlock forest or a, a red spruce yellow birch forest. As the forest gets older and these uh, the trees age and natural disturbances accumulate, the forest just becomes increasingly complex. Uh, trees die, they fall down, they create the gaps that Liz was talking about in the canopy. And all of that complexity uh, creates all of these uh, all this habitat diversity in the forest. Uh, it can support, uh, there's opportunities for many more species. Uh, there's more resiliency in the forest because of the diversity of, of many habitats within the forest. And so that's, that's something that's just lacking from a younger forest. And it's something that for the most part, there's certain aspects of it that can be mimicked through management, uh, but there's also things that just accumulate over time. Uh, and maybe Liz, do you want to talk about some of these uh, unique places? Yeah, I, I, the northern white cedar swamp, for example, um, just, you know, you just got a glimpse of some of the incredible diversity in those places when you see 
and David, maybe you can talk about this too. When um, you know, when you see down trees, trees being left on the ground to rot as they naturally would, rather than being removed from the forest, all kinds of habitat, as we saw for mosses, and the mosses in turn provide a seedbed for other species to become established. And so it's a very complex, becomes a very complex system and, and all kinds of, well, another thing is that all kinds of fungi find good habitat in those old forests. And so it becomes a very just biologically diverse, but also that functioning of the, the fungi interacting with the trees and the other plants is, um, is just a very, very rich system. So all kinds of wildlife, all kinds of plants, um, and then I don't know, you know, if, if you mentioned um, hydrological regulation, um, this can really, these, these old forests can really help with, with just the movement of water off the landscape can be, they can be like sponges almost. And um, some people talk about old forests as being very, you know, very spongy to walk through, like the soil is, is got so much, uh, organic matter in it that it feels like walking on on a spongy surface and that that spongy surface is you know is great for absorbing water. David you want to have add anything else? Oh no I mean you hit it pretty well I guess yeah for me it's emphasizing that diversity of sort of dec decay classes or decay material um, you just you just don't see that in um, like intensively managed forests. Um, I think as you all said, it's just, it's an incredible uh, network, you know, even from the little mammals, you know, the mycorrhizal layers and everything. So, yeah, it's just, and I think that's, you know, as a consulting forester, I think that's a lot of times what you're striving for is to, to get, keep some of that dead wood in there. And so many times, it's like always called the European forest where folks want to, they just want to be very clean and they can walk through it. And, it's a forest that you have really trouble walking through, climbing over stuff. When you go out west and you go out, you know, the red woods and black birds, and you can't even climb over some of the trees. It's really difficult. So, anyway. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, another question, um, a question from Beth. Given the range of habitats where white cedar is found, um, from wetlands to dry limestone cliffs, is there a particularly extraordinary range of genetic diversity in this species? Oh, you know, I don't think we know. That's a really great question, really interesting question. And I, I don't think um, that kind of research has really been done to determine whether those habitats, those physical habitats support different genetic um, uh, populations of northern white cedar. Um, one thing, you know, we do know is that as you go further north in its range, northern white cedar becomes more of a generalist species in terms of it, it doesn't, isn't, doesn't seem to be restricted to those extremely dry or extremely wet environments necessarily, but it can grow more um, successfully on just sort of your regular upland. Um, so things, so, so this, so they do mix um, more in those situations. Either David or Bob, do you know anything more about the genetics of northern white cedar and whether, yeah, so the fact that the three of us don't know doesn't mean it's not known, but it's, it's at least we don't, we, we haven't seen that research um, to cite. Thank you. Thanks, Liz. Um, another question from Tom. I've read that VT attempted a caribou reintroduction years back, but it didn't work out. Was this because of lack of old growth forest or lichen or something else? Bob from the Fish and Wildlife Department. Yeah, I guess I have to take that one. Uh, I'm actually not uh, aware of a caribou reintroduction effort in Vermont. Uh, Maine tried it in the 80s maybe, I, I may not have that right, and they didn't persist. I don't know what the um, what factors were at play there, uh, whether it was forest condition or just the size of forest patches or, or some other thing, I, I don't know, unfortunately. Yeah, my, my gut reaction would be habitat. Habitat. Dish, dishes. Yeah, 
like oh, the caribou. Yeah, I'm thinking about elk also. I mean, they're just they just need big areas to go. Okay, thank you. Great question. Um, and we have a question from Susan here, and Susan is wondering um, if the the cliffs um, here in Vermont are part of the um, Niagara Escarpment or somehow connected? They are not, no. That formation actually begins quite a bit further west. Um, so they're not part of the Niagara Escarpment. That's a great question. I'm glad you asked it because it uh, didn't make that clear. But um, the cliffs that we have are very much like in geological origin and in, um, well, at least in the makeup of the rock and in, uh, in their aspect um, and slope and soils, they're very, very similar to the soils on the Niagara Escarpment, but it's a different, it's a separate ge geological feature. So very common, a lot, of, a lot of commonalities, but not part of the part of the actual Niagara Escarpment. Do, um, do check out that book, The Last Stand. It's really fascinating. Great, thank you. Um, and we have a, a question here from Bill who's wondering, um, if if you have a kind of a working definition of what you would of what an old forest is or an old growth forest, well, our our working definition it's very vague. Um, you know, so going back to how I defined it at the beginning of the talk, um, very vague. It's a it's a forest that has been um, under uh, natural ecological processes for a long time. And uh, really, a really old growth forest has been is one that's been under natural ecological processes for three to four centuries. Um, so that is a, that's a really you know, and there are lots of believe me, there are lots of people who have different definitions of what an old growth forest is, and people who have different definitions of what an old forest is. But that very very broad definition, which just is time, just continuity of process over time is how Charlie Cogbill describes it. And I think that's perfect. Um, so really that's, that's all it is. Doesn't mean that it doesn't have um, any human influence whatsoever. We've got old growth forests that have been sugar bushes. Um, you know, we've got old growth forests that we call old growth forests. We have an old growth for forest, not we, but there is an old growth forest in southwestern New Hampshire that was completely blown over by the 1938 hurricane. It's still considered an old growth forest because that is a natural ecological process. And, and the timber was not removed from there, it was not salvaged. And so that's still an old growth forest, even though the standing trees are really quite young. Uh, so uh, less than 100 years old. So um, it doesn't have to have trees of a certain age, although often it does. It doesn't have to have trees of a certain size, though often it does. Um, so that's the that's my working definition of an old growth forest. How about you, Bob or, or, or David? I'll just add that um, we, we defined, well, a couple of places uh, Vermont Fish and Wildlife and Forest Parks and Recreation have defined an old forest. Uh, and uh, Bill, you may be familiar with the uh, use value appraisal manual and the, uh, uh, there's, there's an ecologically uh, significant treatment area definition for old forest that landowners can use uh, it to uh, uh, enroll part of their land as, a, as an old forest if it meets certain criteria that are, are many of the things that that Liz talked about at the beginning, the trees older than 150 years, development of structural characteristics, uh, and not necessarily no sign of, of human uh, interference, but very minimal. And uh, there's probably a few other criteria there that I'm forgetting, but- uh, and In that definition of old forest that is that applies to the use value appraisal program, there has to be measurable uh, things. Um, so it's it's a little different than the old growth forest definition because there's got to be things that you can measure and show. So it's, um, it's, it's a bit more specific. Does that make sense, Bob? David, any, any thoughts from you? Great. Well, I think that's probably a good place for us to wrap up. Um, so thank you. 
again, um, everyone for uh, joining us here tonight at this event. A reminder um, to check your email tomorrow for a survey and some resources. And we hope to see you at um, another VLT event soon. Maya, could I just add that if people want to get in touch with us personally, please do. We'll be more than happy to answer other questions um, by email. So. Great. All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Thank you, everyone.